Okay, well, I'll go ahead and get things going. Uh, hey, everybody, thanks for joining us for uh, for another virtual round of the uh, Idaho uh, Tech Council's uh, Tech to Market Committee. Um, we uh, we like to have these uh, monthly speaker series, which thankfully uh, we were able to keep going through the um, uh, through the lockdown. And uh, you know, I, I don't know, Jay, are we are we getting to the point where we, next month we might consider doing this in person? We're getting close. I think that we might have one more month where we have uh, have this, and then maybe we'll start looking at uh, probably August would be my guess. Okay. Well, um, we'll uh, we'll get back to everybody on what you know what our, our lineup is for, for next month. I think you know a lot of it's based on the feedback we get from you, uh, what you want to see here. Um, so, you know, Kyle, uh, Kyle, Kyle, we need to also work this out with our friends at Holly Troxel. So Brad Frazier needs to let us know about this as well as we start looking at getting back together live. So anyway. Right. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk you to guys you. are always welcome. You're always welcome, Jay. We're going to come to your living room, Brad. So. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Brad. And you guys have been so great to us um, having that space for us available there. We'd really love to get back there. Uh, I can't wait to have another uh, Main Street deli sandwich. Uh, their, their breakfast sandwiches are awesome, and, uh, and the coffee is great too. So, um, you know, pretty soon, hopefully, we'll be able to meet up again. Um, you know, in the meantime, there's been a lot of really interesting developments, and uh, you know, I, I think I'll just kind of summarize in, um, you know, from the from the things we like to you know analyze and uh, dissect and study here in this group. Um, we're going to have so much to talk about as we see the various economic indicators and just all the metrics get moved with uh you know these kind of un unprecedented uh events that uh that are you know swinging markets and industries and, and causing you know different reactions so um I, I think we'll have a lot to talk about for for months and years um seeing you know maybe maybe there were some uh, assumptions that we had that didn't really hold true uh throughout this and, and maybe it tells us a little bit more about other uh, underlying assumptions that we make um, what's been really exciting to see, and you know, we got to hear a lot about it yesterday, is uh, the, you know, the resiliency of Idaho's economy, and you know, a lot of things happening in, uh, in the tech world and um, the startup and companies coming out of here are pretty strong, um, agile, and uh, able to adapt and overcome. So uh, I didn't get to uh, to see all of the um, the events yesterday, but. We definitely did. Um, that actually finished uploading around 11 o'clock last night. Uh, that's that's one thing that's been a challenge for me is the fact that residential internet has not so great on the upload. But it is up there. Um, and the actual recording is quite a bit better um, for some parts than the streaming ones. So it's actually kind of a, a good thing to go back if there were some parts that uh, maybe didn't, didn't get to really hear. Um. So we, uh, we really encourage you to go and uh, check that out uh, on the link on the website. Um, they just put a lot of work recently into uh, the website. It's uh, got some really valuable information there now. Uh, not as good as before, but uh, you know, I was last time uh, that I uh, checked in yesterday, uh, the was, uh, 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 pretty, uh, pretty streamlined and uh, easy to find stuff. Um, so why don't I kick it back over to Jay real quick for uh, just a real quick uh, around IT uh, update us on the things that are going on and uh, um, and uh, our uh, guest speakers. Sounds good, Kyle. Hey, Matt, are you back on? Did you want to have any? Did you have anything to say, Matt? Are you able to talk now? Yeah. So Sorry about that. As soon as I was, I think I was telling you, I was heading down to Cedar City, Utah. I hit a dead patch. <laughs> well, we're glad you're back with us. Uh, um, any, um, so, so just a couple, couple thoughts. Uh, and if you are, if you could, if you're not speaking right now, if you could put your phone on mute, that'd be wonderful, everyone. That'd be awesome. Um, the the one of the things that really was really fun about last, yesterday that you probably saw was that um, the the ability for us to be able to really grow a tech com 
tech uh, industry in Idaho is all about the community. Uh, let me give you a quick illustration of that. We basically came up with about, I would say, $2.6 billion of revenue that we were able, I mean, of investment that we were able to take in Idaho in private placement, mergers and acquisition, and IPOs. Okay. So within about, um, about a 30 day period, we were able to, to identify another $1.4 billion of investment in Idaho because of the, of the investment community coming together and saying, these are deals that we weren't able to look at based upon some traditional methodology by which we could check them. So it was really awesome to be able to see that we now have over $4 billion we were able to capture. Uh, our deals were down by about maybe six that we did less. We did about 154 deals that were from uh, during, um, you know, 2019. But I think that speaks highly of our ability to be able to understand how important it is for us to build a, to, to build a network. And we're seeing more, more deals come in that are going to be able to be tracked. Um, and I think that as we look into 2020, uh, even with uh, COVID-19, we're going to have some awesome um, uh, investment opportunities to talk about. The top one that we talked about was what Andy Scoggin talked about. And unfortunately, yesterday, and David was talking about this, Andy's uh, audio was not as crisp as we needed it to be. So the uh, intent that we're going to have is we're actually going to uh, possibly re, we're going to re uh, record that for posterity's sake and then uh, put that back on so that we'll have a better recording of that on our uh, podcast. But uh, the uh, one thing about that is that you have uh, Apollo came in and basically set the net worth of of the um, Albertsons companies at ten billion dollars because they bought about seventeen percent of the company for one point seven five billion dollars, and it also sets the stage for uh, uh, as Andy was talking about an IPO, but the IPO will probably take place with everything that's taking place. Uh, and how hot the market is. Their revenues are up 32%. You'll probably see the IPO take place in the next 30 days, which will also be then in the 2020 deal flow report. So all these things that are taking place are phenomenal um, for our state. Uh, one other uh, quick quick item. We will be uh, having the um, Hall of Fame this coming year. And this year, as you probably are all aware, Stowe Reeves has decided they do not uh, because of the runway and all of the logistics taking place with the Idaho uh, Innovation Awards, we're not going to have those. But what we will have in the place of that is that the ITC is going to make sure that we have, we're going to have it, uh, it's, I'm not sure exactly what we're going to call it yet, but we're going to have a no um, nominations come in for the Pivot Awards. And it's the companies that have done, or the organizations, and you can all think of several of them if you start thinking really about it very quickly that have made pivots to be able to adjust to the demands of COVID-19. And the uh, idea with that is that we will either have, you either make pivots right now or something's happened with your company and you have had to lay off people, you've had to do other things. And the hope is we can identify pivots. So I'll give you a quick illustration. I'm not, this is not a, this is an organization. I know Digital Learning Alliance is talking about how they've delivered so much more content virtually to students because of COVID-19. Um, and the pivots they've done like about 10 different pivots because of all of this stuff, the demands that they've had. That's an organization probably that we'll want to recognize. There are several companies that have done similar things that you can talk, we can talk about. And I think what we might do, um, Kyle and Matt, is we'd like to be able to maybe have um, some discussions about companies that have pivoted and maybe a couple of those on maybe during the month of July or August so that we can really take a look at that. This will also talk about how impactful the second round of COVID-19 might be. So, so that's pretty much uh, what's going on. We've, we've been very uh, uh, pleased about a lot of things that have taken place with our economy, although uh, we do have a much higher unemployment rate we see a whole different economy than what we saw in February. We've had so many companies in our state that had probably the hottest first quarter that they've ever had. 
and then to be able to uh, see what's going on. Several of them have had really good second quarters or are coming out of um, what be coming out of second quarter better than what they thought. And, and as, uh, so anyway, there's some very positive things. There's also some things that are very concerning, but um, I think that we'll see uh, uh, 20, 2020 will be one of those years where we really will look back and we'll have an opportunity to really look at companies that have had opportunities to meet cu customers' demands um, uniquely and then also figure those out so that they could uh, find new markets and new abilities uh, to be able to produce products and services. And that's what the tech the market's all about. So Kyle, I'll hand it back to you and Matt. Um, yeah, Matt, did you have any... Uh, no, I, I think I think the big thing is um, I think we've got about 15 of us on this phone call. Um, I, I just want to let everyone know if if there's a if there's a topic that comes up um, that that you think we need to get that out to the uh, to the community to the ITC members. Please uh, email myself, Kyle, Jay, David, Christina, anyone on the IPC team, um, and so we can try to start plugging that in, uh, especially with COVID and the pandemic. Uh, if, if there if there is uh, a hot new trend or technology or product, um, let, let us know because th th this is exactly what the platform is for, and. Um, I just want to make sure we kind of extend that out, and uh, it, 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 this tech to market uh, group is is pretty unique, where it allows us to be fairly nimble to pivot, but but again to be able to share some of these stories. So uh, I want I want to definitely put that out there, um, and then I know Jay touched on uh, the Capital Connect, which is which is again amazing um and it's i know it's a little tough and it's kind of a different format we're in but um uh, what we typically like to do is having having everyone kind of go around um they kind of introduce themselves uh i don't know if that's easier since i'm driving i can't see the screen but uh i I think it would be a good idea before we kind of turn it back to Kyle and Kyle will do the introductions. Um, but uh, I don't know if uh, David or, or if you can maybe kind of help facilitate that if that, if that makes hey, sense. Hey, Matt, I'd, I'd be happy to do it if that's all right with you and Kyle. I'll, why don't we start? I'll just, we'll just go around. Uh, maybe we'll start with Steve Frisco. I, uh, Steve Frisco, you're on, you're on right now. You want to take that and then we'll go to Jason Stoworthy right after. Sure, sure. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm I'm not gonna switch on video because it's been uh, you don't really want to see me sweaty and not showered. But um, I'm a partner with Ali Troxel. I do a lot of M and A, um, uh, fi fund uh, not fundraising, financing. Uh, I guess fundraising and sort of general corporate work with a variety of um, companies throughout the state, um, <clears throat> wherever they might need help. You guys, have, that sounds good, Jason. Yeah, uh, Jason Stallworthy. I'm the director of technology deployment at Idaho National Laboratory, and I do have a little bit of good news. In the last couple of weeks, uh, we won five STTR awards with small businesses and uh, eight technology commercialization fund awards at a value of six and a half million dollars. And one of those was uh, Energy out of uh, Pocatello and uh, a project to help take our micro grid algorithms and implement them in Sean's, um, uh, you know, uh, components and, and, and uh, products. So uh, that'll be, a, I think, a total of about two, two to $300,000 for this round. But if we get into the next round of phase two, it could be up to $3 million to help him commercialize that. So. Jason, congratulations! And by the way, let's we should have Sean on this call next time, you guys. Sean Lundgraf should be. Uh, we should have him talk about the technology. Then they've got some other stuff that's really cool going on, don't they? So, 
Yeah. So we're pretty excited about that. Are you, you look like you're at a jungle. It looks great behind you. <laughs> you know, I, I'm actually up at high C today. So, uh, it looks great. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we go to, uh, um, C Roach. Is that Celinda? Is that you? Well, if we don't, we'll go to, then we'll go to Kaz yeah, and Jolene I, Anderson. I couldn't unmute. Forgive me. Oh, you're okay. Celinda. Okay. All right. And I'll even show my face here. Hi. Um, I'm the general manager for Sparklight here in Boise. Uh, we have uh, been very, very busy connecting uh, people that need internet and doing it in different ways. Uh, we haven't done necessarily the traditional kinds of installs uh, due to social distancing but we haven't turned anyone away and uh, we have a long, actually a fairly short list considering everything of go backs to make things right. And over the course of COVID, we've launched across the state, I want to say over a hundred Wi-Fi spots so that uh, people would have access to the internet. Hey, Selinda, thank you for all the work you guys have been doing. And by the way, thank you so much for opening your, your, your uh, portals so you don't charge people for going over their data for the last couple of months. That's been yeah. very, very helpful. So thank you. We're glad we could do that. Yeah. Amy, and then we'll go to uh, Jolene. All right. Um, well, I, I just wanted to, I'm Amy Lentz. I'm at Idaho National Laboratory. I lead the supply chain, which includes our workforce and our business ecosystem. Um, and I, I'm really excited what Jason just told you um, for for our partner with our partners at Idaho National Lab. One other thing I just briefly wanted to mention is um, we are partnering with uh, Idaho Commerce right now to really kind of launch um, energy as one of the core industries of in, in Idaho. And what that means is that um, we're kind of collecting the information on all the energy related companies in Idaho and then also um, working with John Chapburn's organization, the Office of Energy, highlighting Idaho and all of the value that it brings to the energy sector. So soon we will be um, rolling out um, a kind of a, a guide, if you will. It might be more of a marketing piece, but it's um, growing Idaho's energy economy. And it really breaks down all the benefits of the energy industry in Idaho. Not only that we're a low cost um, energy state, but also the, the number of suppliers that are in our state and the infrastructure that exists so new energy can come on to the marketplace. So. I just wanted to make sure you guys were aware of that because it's very exciting for us at INL right now because we are uh, per, we are working with a lot of companies that are interested in citing their new energy technologies in Idaho, some at Idaho National Laboratory site, some in Idaho. And so um, that partnership with Commerce, I think, is fantastic. And um, I think it really will start shining a big beautiful light on Ian, on Idaho in terms of what it offers. And just a quick trivia component, um, Utah has advertised themselves really well as being a renewable clean energy state. Um, and that's attracted companies like um, Facebook and um, even Verizon and others who want to find places to locate their businesses that have a source of most of their energy comes from renewable sources. Well, in reality, Idaho's renewable and clean energy sources are much higher than Utah's. And so that could really play to our favor very well in terms of attracting new businesses in the energy industry. Amy, that's awesome. I'd love to talk to you more about that on Vision, I mean, for Vision Idaho and the Knowledge Report. So we'll, we'll, we'll follow up with you on that. And we're going to skip really quick. Jolene, we're going to come back to you. Carmen, we, we, uh, Archibald, because of the stuff you're talking about with uh, 
commerce. Karma, could you talk or, or uh, go next? And if you have anything to add to what Amy's talked about, that'd be great. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, Carmen Otwell, Idaho Commerce. I oversee the Idaho Global Entrepreneurial Mission or the iGEM grant program that most people are more familiar with. Uh, just to echo what Amy um, stated, it was a great partnership. Really, I think this is going to be a tool that uh, not only energy can use, the energy sector can use, but really to highlight just the uniqueness of our state, our hydro. It's a very diverse portfolio, and I just think it's, it's going to be a, just a good a good brochure to really highlight Idaho's strengths. And so I'm excited for it to come out. Um, thank you for including us, Amy, in, in, this, in this project. It's been fun. Um, in regards to iGEM, for those that don't know, iGEM is a state-funded grant program that helps Idaho companies commercialize their new and viable products, technologies, or services um, with, um, and that's done in cooperation with Idaho's public research universities. And there are three here in Idaho. Boise State University, Idaho State University, and the University of Idaho. To date, we just closed out, um, last week we just closed out fiscal year 20, and we allocated and used all of our funds, so I'm very excited about that. To date, we've invested just about, um, just shy of $8 million into new and viable um, technologies within the state of Idaho, so I'm, I'm really excited. Um, this has been a, an ongoing trend that we've been able to really find some quality product, um, projects and, and technologies that are coming forward. The last two were from Pitch Arrow, Pitch Aeronautics, and then Free to Feed. Um, so Pitch Arrow partnered with Boise State, and then Free to Feed um, with Trill Pollen. Um, she partnered with the University of Idaho. Fantastic. Thanks, Carmen. You bet. Thanks. That's a great update. Jolene. Hi, uh, Jolene Anderson, and thank you, Jay, for the introduction at the beginning. Um, I'm now a managing director for a new regional fund called Vector Point Impact Partners. We advise and invest in seed and early stage companies, but most of you know me through Coretsu Forum and, the, and my own consulting company. So I've been advising and investing in companies probably 25 years. Uh, we live in East Boise. My passion is things that will change the healthcare outcomes for Idaho, as well as clean tech. Um, and I'm really delighted to work with some, some amazing people, but Carmen has been such a great resource. Right now I'm mentoring a, a founder who is, hopefully has a, um, proto he has a prototype for um, uh, a helmet that will prevent concussions at contact sports. And so knowing that we have an ecosystem here that will help grow these companies up really is incredibly helpful for those of us who are advising and mentoring companies. Really an honor to be part of the Idaho Tech Council. Thanks, Jolene, for Vector Point and everything you're going to be doing. And the Kritsu Forum I listened to on the mountain reaching out of Denver, they had some amazing technologies on the biospace that they were presenting. That was amazing. So. Yes, anyway. so I've been on the Life Science Screening Committee for about six years, but if you'd like to join as a guest one time, you'll see how we screen companies before we allow them to pitch. Amazing. Thanks. Kaz. I come off mute. Hello, this is Kaz Lawler. Um, <laughs> uh, I work for Emerson now. Emerson acquired PacSense in late 2016. Uh, I do engineering and technology work um, across a variety of engineering and technology from uh, materials and innovation, uh, materials through sensors to just systems in general. And this is a great forum for learning more about what's going on in Idaho. And Kaz presented to our group about six months ago, right Kaz? Uh, January, yes, you're right. Yeah, so it was pretty impressive. Oh, thanks, Kaz. Uh, appreciate all you're doing. I guess we're going to also, we'll come back to, uh, uh, obviously, Brad and Jeremy. Um, I don't know, Jeremy, if you want Karen and Danny to go or to talk, or are they going to be part of your presentation? They can, they can go right ahead. Okay. Danny, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm Danny Evans. I am a junior technology assessment and licensing associate. So I work under Jeremy. I help assess the IP or potential IP that's in the technologies and discoveries that come out of university um, research. 
Um, and I also review contracts, licenses, MTAs, NDAs, all the licensing stuff in, with the, um, the industry partners. Great. Thanks, Danny. Karen. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hopefully. Okay, good. Because I'm, I don't have high speed internet. I'm five minutes from downtown Spokane, and you can't get high-speed internet here. Mm. So it's amazing. But yeah, I do essentially what Danielle does, but a lot longer. I've been with the university since 2008. And uh, I'm a nuclear chemist by education and a prior work. I worked for the federal government for 15 years. And... Uh, now I'm a licensing associate, or have been, uh, at the University of Idaho. And it's fun because I like the diversity from engineering to ag. It's, it's really nice to have a, uh, a good cross-section. So, we, we love the portfolio and the, word, the, the hands that you're in with U of I. So thank you all that what you and Danny do. Thank you. So... And I think that we'll go up. Uh, I think it, I really, I know you have the Boise State shirt. I think it's Dave, right? Uh, Don. Don, I'm sorry, Don, my fault. That's all right, no worries. Uh, Don Azevedo, uh, project manager from the uh, new product development world in my previous lives. A couple of the notable things we worked on were the single wafer, single chamber, process development when I was at SCP, uh, converting that into a multi-chamber single wafer process, really tightly control the, what's going on at the wafer surface. And then uh, pioneering the backpack, backpack uh, battery operated vacuum for commercial, uh, formerly ProTeam and then Emerson. So a couple degrees of separation. Uh, we were purchased by Emerson and they've taken it to another level. So Technology and education are what drives economies. And so I still have a passion and an interest for what's going on in that space because I think that's the new, that's the competitive advantage is brain power. And well said. make a living, I'm working with New York Life. Well, congratulations on that too. Uh, and being in, on the, the beach in, in uh, Hawaii, I like that too. Oh, right. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> well said, Don. Thank you so much. And I think, David, you're on the call, right, Dave? You mean me, Jay? Yes. Oh, of course I'm on the call. Yeah, so, uh, David Moore with the Idaho Technology Council. Uh, yeah, make sure everything runs. I guess. So tell everybody what you do, David. Um, I so I do a lot of different things. My main thing is the uh, Computing Alliance. So uh, right now we are working on Develop Idaho and what that looks like. Um, Similar to Capital Connect, if you guys have seen that yesterday, but uh, um, and then also the uh, the Spark series, which is kind of a, a monthly slash biweekly now thing, a similar format to this, um, but a, a, just a lot more technical type stuff. So, thanks, David. And by the way, uh, David does is also we have Idaho Codes, which has almost eighteen hundred students throughout the state that are taking a, um, a foundational uh, coding course. And 33% of those are female and 67 of them are from underserved or rural areas. So it's amazing how many people are taking this thing, 1,800 students throughout the state. So thanks, David, for you get what you're doing with Idaho Codes. All right. So Kyle, that's, I think uh, we'll just uh, we'll have Jeremy and Brad are going to go Nick, uh, next, but I'll just turn it back to you and Matt. Yeah, well, introduce our, our speakers uh, today. We have a couple guest speakers. I don't know which order you've uh, arranged to go in because I know you, uh, you both uh, kind of coordinated um, prior, but uh, you know, first we have uh, Jeremy Tamson. He's uh, uh, the director of the Office of uh, Technology Transfer um, at the University of Idaho. Uh, he's got a tremendous background in you know, business and industry law, and uh, just you're all probably very familiar with him um, in around here for uh, a lot of the ITC stuff, um, pretty you know, heavily involved. Um, and then uh, you know, along with him, we have Brad Fraser, who's a partner at Holy Troxel, uh, specializes in um, internet and intellectual property law. Uh, so uh, again, you know, uh, a, a 
voice the veterans uh, for you know all of the, the various groups we have around here. Like, um, also very heavily involved with ITC. Uh, I had the pleasure of having him on one of my panels at uh, Voice Startup Week last year, uh, talking about uh, 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 just uh, you know uh, malicious attacks and, uh, and and things uh, happening uh, uh, in industry for uh, forgetting the term right now. Um, uh, cyber crime, uh, uh, cyber attacks, and uh, and going after intellectual property, ransomware. I think is the focus of that one. Um, also, you know, Holly Troxel, a big supporter of this group, and uh, you know, sponsors our meetings there in their offices. Uh, so, why don't I hand it over to uh, who is it? Is it Brad or Jeremy who's going first? Brad will start, but I'm just going to remind the group where we're at in our series first. So, let me get my uh, presentation open here. You guys, okay, can you see that uh, that window? Yep, we got it. Great, so uh, this is part two in a, in a series about intellectual property, sort of what is it and how you might use it um, in your business or your organization. So we talked last time about patent rights, which as you can see on this difficulty to obtain continuum, that's what we have at the end, the most difficult to obtain, complicated, expensive, um, and, and generally can be a tedious process to obtain patent rights. What we're talking about today is trademarks, and these fall somewhere in the middle of difficulty to obtain. Um, and you'll find out why uh, as we go ahead. So let me go ahead and there we go. Brad, take it away. Well, thank you, Jeremy, and good morning, everybody. I'm Brad Fraser, a partner at Holly Troxel, as has been said. Appreciate having the opportunity to join with you all this morning and talk for a few minutes about trademark law as part of my practice as an intellectual property law practitioner in Holly Troxel. Jeremy's introduction is especially relevant in terms of the, the difficulty of obtaining these types of properties and intellectual property protections. Just by way of introduction, I think it will resonate with this group if I say that I'm a big proponent of monetizing intellectual property. I don't believe in intellectual property in a vacuum. I believe in intellectual property as an asset that will permit you to either raise money or have an exit, a successful exit. It's been my experience that startups who pay attention to an intellectual property portfolio uh, at the very beginning of, the, of their life, see that come back 10X, 20X, either when they need to raise money or when they need to have an exit. Because as you know, all of you know that when somebody's doing due diligence on a target, one of the first things they ask is let's see your IP portfolio. So trademarks is an important, are an important part of that portfolio. And so when someone will call me and say, hey, Brad, start up here in Eagle, Idaho, or start up here in Ketchum, or wherever we happen to be, I want to trademark my logo because I'm a startup, and someone told me that I need to trademark my logo. <laughs> well, as you can see from the first slide, I typically over the years have learned to disagree with that concept. Trademark is not a verb. Trademark is a noun. And a trademark in the United States, trademark is not a verb. In China, it's a verb. And in many other countries, it in fact is a verb, but not in the United States. In the United States, trademark is a noun. And we'll talk about the reasons why. Trademark is so important in 2020 or, and going forward for startups because trademark is now inextricably connected with the concept of brand. So when we look at immediate assets that a startup can acquire in the intellectual property space, when we say trademark now, we also have to say inextricably and, and immutably, we also say social media domain names, uh, internet presence, internet real estate, search engine optimization. Because as you all know, a startup that doesn't have any patents or perhaps doesn't have any registered trademarks or registered copyrights, who may still have, let's say, what, 10,000 Twitter followers or 50,000 Instagram followers, still has a viable product to sell because social media now is, is, is commerce. Social media is a commodity. So I combine now trademark and brand and brand includes all of those internet constructs. So having said that, trademark is not a verb. Jeremy, could we advance to the next slide, please? I have very strong feelings about what constitutes a clean trademark. When a company calls me and, and asks for advice on brand, and I probably will say brand now, not just trademark, but brand, I advise them and encourage them to think about four characteristics of a strong, viable, monetizable brand. Not only will these four characteristics help you in defending your brand as you launch your startup, but they'll also create more value for you either at a VC round or an angel round or whatever, or an exit. 
sophisticated investors, sophisticated buyers want to buy monopolies. They want to buy brands that are strong. And the best way to do that is to follow these four characteristics. So first, let's remember that a trademark, which is not a verb, but which is a noun, because in the United States, I think Jeremy will talk about this, trademark rights accrue immediately upon use. In the United States, when you use something as a trademark, you acquire what are called common law trademark rights. You may go on and register it, as we'll talk about, but in the United States, it's a noun. The moment you use something as a trademark, you acquire those rights. But what, what characteristics should that thing have before we appropriate it, even as a common law trademark? Well, one, it must be capable of functioning as a trademark, meaning let's not choose something which is descriptive or generic. For example, let's assume that you have a, uh, an idea for a, a new device that helps you um, trim trees. Okay, that's your startup. You're going to have a device that trims trees. Well, you might call me and say, Brad, I want to trademark my logo. My trademark is Tree Master. Well, that would inherently fail the first test. Tree Master is generic or descriptive of the product. So even though it tells consumers immediately what you're selling, it's a very poor trademark. So we encourage clients to think of things which are neither generic nor descriptive, like Trivago, Zillow, Google, Zulily, and Noom, and on and on. <laughs> That's why they coined those terms, is because someone showed them the slide and said, oh, well, we don't want to have a descriptive thing as our trademark. We want it to be fanciful. Number two, it should be one that you can use without getting sued and losing. I always add, add losing on the end because everybody gets sued. This is America. You want to be able to have your trademark and defend it against a cease and desist letter. Nobody wants to buy a company or invest in a company that's going to get sued for trademark infringement the moment it gets acquired and lose that lawsuit. That's just a bad risk. Nobody's going to buy you. Third, it should be one that you can register with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Registered trademarks are worth more money than common law trademarks. Just a fact, because I've done deals after deals after deals, and you get more money with a registered trademark. And then lastly, it should be one that you can support with domains and social media. I would not encourage a client to pick a trademark, even if it's fanciful, like Zillow, if you can't get social media and domain names to support the launch. In my view, a good brand has these four characteristics. Uh, Jeremy, please, next slide. So a startup might ask, well, that's great, Brad. How do we determine all that? And the answer is, well, we do a trademark search. We do a search. And I have some strong feelings about trademark searches as well. <laughs> um, you, you may uh, just simply pay for a trademark search. Each of you probably receive three or four emails a day from a trademark search firm or a patent search firm or somebody that says, I'll do a trademark search for you. That's fine. But remember that what you really want, and I'm not trying to sell my services here, whoever you engage to do a trademark search should be able to, frankly, intelligently answer those four questions for you. A trademark search candidly has no value. If the, the person from whom you obtain it cannot opine and say, yeah, you can use that without getting sued and losing. Yeah, you can register that with USPTO. Yeah, that's not generic or descriptive because failing those four things, you'll spend a lot of time and money and you'll end up in a situation where you have to rebrand because you got a cease and desist letter or it's generic or whatever the case may be. So my advice is when you start to think about your brand, let's start with a search that hopefully answers those four questions on the previous slide. Uh, Jeremy, next slide, please. This is the famous trademark continuum. You will remember that one of my four ideal characteristics is that the mark should not be generic or descriptive. We want you to pick strong trademarks, those that are protectable, defendable, registrable, monetizable, worth value when someone buys your company. And so the continuum teaches us how we analyze trademarks on the spectrum from descriptive and generic at the left side to fanciful and strong at the right side. The example I chose is shoe polish. So let's assume that you have a new, a new product and it happens to be shoe polish. Well, clearly a poor brand would be shoe polish because that's literally generic of what the thing is. But then you might decide, well, I still want it to convey a little something about the product. So let's call it shoe gleam. That's not specifically generic like shoe polish, but it still whispers something about the product. This is called a descriptive mark. Still hard to enforce, still hard to register, not strong, but better than shoe polish. Or you might then have moved to the suggestive type of trademark. One of an example of that would be <clears throat> Walk and Glow. 
Wash and Glow does not convey immediately that it's shoe polish, it suggests it. And then lastly, of course, some of you may have used this product. Some of you probably have in your closet an old can of Kiwi brand shoe polish. When you look up Kiwi in the dictionary, you still see either a small flightless bird from New Zealand or a small green a hairy fruit, right? You don't see shoe polish yet, which tells us the Kiwi is not generic. So as you're thinking about your brand strategy for your startup, please, please, please pick brands and trademarks at the right end of the continuum. Now, some of you will scream and yell and say, but Brad, but Brad, it's hard to teach consumers what Zillow is. It's hard to teach them what Noom is, what Zulily is. Nobody knows these coin terms. Well, <laughs> 15 years ago, I might have been sympathetic. But in 2020, teaching consumers what Zoom, what Noom is, is simple. It's called, it's social media. It's free. So I will not hear an argument that I'm not going to pick a trademark like Zoom or, or Noom or Zulily because consumers don't know what it is. That argument doesn't resonate with me anymore. So, Jeremy, with that, let's move to, I think, my last slide here, which is an example. Oh, no. I have got one more. Uh, trademark best practices. So, as you're advising your clients and others, startups, about trademark best practices, my strong advice would be to follow these characteristics, follow these practices, if you want to have either an investment or an exit and get the most money you can out of your brand. One, select strong trademarks. Please don't select things that are generic or descriptive. Those are hard to enforce. They don't make you a lot of money. They're hard to register. It just brings heartache. Make up a word. Grab your Scrabble bag, pick out eight letters, eight tiles, put them on the coffee table, mix them around and make up a word like Noom or Zulily. Strong trademark. Number two, before you launch, please do a clearance search. You really want to know. And more importantly, your investors and your buyers want to know. Are you going to get sued and are you going to lose that lawsuit? That's really important to know. In fact, just this week, I had a client call me to receive a cease and desist letter. And if they had, if they got sued, they would lose that lawsuit. Well, you know, in retrospect, if we'd done a search, we would have probably picked a different mark for them. Third, register the trademark when you can, when practical and when you have the money. It's not expensive or hard to register a trademark because remember, trademark is not a verb, it's a noun. The moment you use something as a trademark, you have common law trademark rights. But when you can, it's important to register it, both domestically and internationally, because you get more money for a registered trademark. Don't infringe. Be cognizant of your marketing environment. and Don't infringe on other people's trademarks. Don't get clever. Don't get cute. Don't say, well, I have a weight loss algorithm, and there's one out there called Noom, so I'm going to call mine Noomer. I don't know. Just don't do <laughs> Don't do that. And then lastly, Jeremy, thanks for the prompt there. Let's go to that. Oh, I'm sorry. And then lastly, use a TM, which means put a TM on it to claim a common law trademark right. And because Jeremy's on the line from the University of Idaho, we have our University of Idaho folks, I had to just throw this slide in just to say, well, yeah, but Boise State has a registered trademark in the color blue for their turf. So uh, when people say you can't trademark a color, and Jeremy, I think, is going to talk about this. Well, sure you can. Here's an example. This is a federally registered trademark on Boise State's blue turf. So there you go. So if anybody out there wants to put a blue, put blue turf in their playing field, know that you'll likely infringe this federally registered trademark owned by Boise State University. All right. Well, Jeremy, I think that's my time. Let me turn it back over to you. And if anybody has any questions, happy to answer them. But Jeremy, I'll throw it back over to you now. Yeah, I, lo I love that example. That's a great example, Brad, with the blue turf, because um, it is very distinctive, right? Um, the basis for the registration is distinctiveness, and I think they have met the bar with respect to their very blue football fields. So I think that is a great example of how trademarks can be used to protect uh, unique elements of your brand or unique elements of your products um, that may not be right. the immediate or the obvious, uh, the obvious thing to protect with trademarks. Um, so Jeremy, I if I may, if I just quickly may, Jeremy, let me just make a note. It was hard to prove that that was distinctive. It was colors in the United States are not inherently distinctive. So we had to spend a lot of time and money proving to the trademark office that that color was distinctive. They've been using it since 1986. We didn't register until 97 or 98 or whatever it was because we had to prove that a, the color was distinctive of a, those types of entertainment services. So you're right, it's distinctive, but we had to do a lot to prove to the trademark office that it really was distinctive. And that, that highlights perfectly some of the points that I'll make um, in that the trade, what we're, what we're going to talk about is, you know, what are we actually talking about? What is the trademark actually protecting for a brand, right? 
So what it's protecting, as Brad highlights, it's the association that a consumer is making between your product and your brand as the source of that product, right? And so these, these logos are very, uh, are very common logos. You see these logos, you know what they mean. You know that if the Google logo is on an internet service, that it's um, coming from Alphabet, that it's you know, reasonably secure, that it might have some fancy new features that you can enable in beta. You know, there's a brand and there's a reputation associated with that provider as well as Apple. And I threw in the old Apple logo just for kicks. Some of you guys probably uh, remember that one. And then um, the Vandals logo. So again, these are protecting a, a, an association that's in the consumer's mind. So it's a, relative, a relatively fragile thing. And uh, as Brad highlighted, it might take some effort to prove that you have acquired enough distinctiveness in the mind of the consumer to qualify for this type of uh, registration um, for your brand. So uh, trademarks come in a variety of types. You know, you might file an application for a picture mark, which like the Apple logo is just um, shapes and colors uh, in a particular way. And so this, the filing for that original Apple logo had all of the Pantone color codes for each of those colors. Uh, they painstakingly describe the exact shape, the radius of the curves on the apple, the way that the bite is taken out, the placement of the bite, all of those things are part of the logo and part of the description in the application. On the other end of the spectrum, you have plain word mark applications, which protect the word no matter how it appears. So Google famously has a different logo on their homepage every single day, right? You can go and you can see the, the word Google, played out, spelled out, sometimes it's a game, sometimes it's a video, you know, obviously they have a lot of resources and so they do this every day. They have a, a changing logo and they remain protected even though the logo changes every single day because that word Google itself is what they've protected using a word mark registration. So no matter how it appears, as long as they're using it on the class of goods or services that they've registered that word, they're still protected in their use of that word. Um, and then you've got blended word and picture marks like the Vandals logo there. Uh, so, you know, those applications combine elements of both the word mark and the picture mark uh, applications. So we talked about this, but what does it mean that rights affix as soon as you use the mark to identify you as the source of the goods or services, right? So you don't have to register your trademark in order to have a trademark. Um, but registration provides you with some enhanced protections. So what you do when, you, when you're using your trademark before you register it, if you're going to register it, you just use the TN symbol. And what you're doing there is you're putting everybody else on, in the market on notice. Hey, everybody, this is my mark. I'm claiming this as my trademark. I'm using it as my trademark. I'm going to put it on goods and services to identify me as the source. Um, and so when you do that, you have a trademark. You don't have to register it. You're using it in commerce. You have a trademark. Um, so key, uh, one key point to having a trademark at all is use in commerce. Um, so it's actually a, a formal requirement of the registration. It's not only uh, a practical concern, as Brad highlighted at the beginning, that you know you shouldn't have intellectual property just to have it. You should have it um, as an asset for your business or organization. And use in commerce is a plain requirement of trademark. Uh, registration or um, trademark recognition is that you're using the mark in commerce and at that time the rights are fixed um, uh, when you use that. Uh, so the circle R you use only after you've obtained the registration for the mark and what that means is hey I'm reserving the rights in this mark for my business. I'm reserving the rights in this mark to identify my business or my organization as the source of this product or service. So again, what you're protecting with the trademark registration is the association that the consumer makes between you and the product. So again, TM and circle R, these are your commonly seen symbols. And then I'm gonna talk about a couple of, of examples that we, um, where we use trademark to protect products that we otherwise didn't have a way to license. So for us, trademarking is an important tool because our organization is not the ultimate source of most of these products or services, right? We provide education services and similar materials under our logos, the Vandals logo and the University of Idaho logo suite. 
Um, but when we go to license products to other people, that's when we're really looking to, to create a portfolio of intellectual property protection around our, um, our assets. And so the trademark becomes an important tool for us because we're always trying to get our, we're always trying to get a third party to take our uh, inventions, discoveries, creations and commercialize them, scale them and offer them to people in the commercial marketplace. So one of these um, products is actually, it, this is an interesting thing. It's a canola trait that allows canola plants to resist this list of group two herbicides, right? And this trait was published on in um, the 1970s. It was never patented and we've incorporated the non-patented trait into our canola varieties that are well suited to this area. So they have this trait, um, the canola varieties themselves, there will be many likely. Um, and so we, we can't use a variety name uh, like Honeycrisp, for example, as the variety name for that apple. You can't use that as a trademark. You can have one or the other. You either use it as the variety name or you use it as a trademark and you can license either or. So here where we have a group of products that will be using this technology, we're going to be using the G2 Flex name to talk about that entire family of varieties. So we'll have variety names underneath the G2 Flex trademark and all of the G2 Flex varieties will have this herbicide resistance trait. Um, so that was, a, that was a nice way for us to give our licensee a way to identify the products as a class, um, but also a way for us to maintain some control and recognition over the use of our product in their business. Another one that we have uh, that was related to plants as well um, was the Bonner Blue trademark. So um, we, we do a lot of different types of agricultural research at the university. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that we do is pomology or the study of fruit production. So we had uh, at one point developed a cross between these two berry bushes, one from Japan that had a very nice flavor and one from Ukraine that had a really hardy growth characteristic. And um, that original cross produced about 50 different types of, of these berries, these Hascat berries um, that were tested, selected from, and scaled uh, by our uh, exclusive licensee in Sandpoint. So you can go to hascapamerica.com and you can buy um, the Bonner Blue bushes. And the bushes, again, this is a class of bushes. They have uh, several different uh, varieties that are, that are sold under the Bonner Blue name, um, but all of them come from the original crosses that were developed by the University of Idaho. So I highly encourage you guys to check out um, Check out hascapamerica.com. That's uh, Legacy Farms is the name of the licensee up in Sandpoint, and they've been great. They've got about uh, 2,000 plants um, in the ground now, and they're able to scale. They've been selling plants to other producers, to nurseries. Um, this was the first year that they were shipping plants. Um, in the past, they were able to sell products from the plants that they were growing, um, so they were processing the berries from the plants. Um, but now they've actually been able to start distributing um, the plants, which is great. So that's all that I've got you guys. And um, you guys might have questions and feel free to fire away if you do. Uh, and otherwise I appreciate, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. I appreciate Brad um, taking the time to, to talk about this as well. Hey, hey Jeremy can, or, or, or Brad, can you guys share with the group this rough estimates or rough cost for you know trademarking um verse um uh yeah i i i guess let's start there with with trademarking how does that rough estimates come in brad why don't you go ahead and, and start with that if that's okay sure jeremy thank you well the range is anywhere from zero dollars to ten thousand dollars zero dollars if you choose to just rely on common law trademarks zero just use it you have a common law trademark put a tm on it off you go if you want to file a nominal us one us registration application on one mark in one international class and the mark is clean no baggage probably around 700 dollars to file a very simple us trademark registration application if you want to go international let's move up now to five thousand dollars if, however, you have picked a mark with baggage, 
and you get sued or you get opposed or there's a problem, you could spend thousands and thousands of dollars trying to register your trademark. So, you know, I think somewhere between zero and a thousand is probably the best answer. But remember that thousand contemplates that you've selected a clean mark, a mark that is registrable. We talked a little bit um, this week on my team uh, about some of the different baggage that can come along uh, with a trademark if you choose a mark that uh, is likely to be contested. And um, Danny, I don't know if you just want to touch really just in a, in a couple sentences about what we talked about um, uh, yesterday. Oh, sure. Um, so in the news, we were talking about the Space Force um, proposed marks from the, Air, the U.S. Air Force that is trying to register Space Force, um, but Netflix has their TV show Space Force with Steve Carell. Uh, Netflix has um, opposed the U.S. Air Force's um, marks, and if anyone has seen, and you can Google the proposed um, picture for the U.S. Space Force, um, it looks very similar to another mark um, in Star Trek. <laughs> so riddled with problems. Um, but yeah, Google that, and it's just, I don't know, it's just funny. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it's so one one thing that can come is that you have somebody who is a competitor or a competing organization who wants to use the mark, and then um, you might have uh, a, as as you do here, you might have somebody who is so interested in opposing your registration that they um, that they challenge your registration at the USPTO. So part of the uh, registration process for your trademark is that it gets published in the official USPTO Gazette which is just basically a website now, but uh, you can go on the Gazette and you can see if other people are trying to file for a mark that you're using. And so you might set up an alert. Um, uh, you might, there are different systems that you can set up to track uh, other users of your mark. But um, yeah, that, that would be one, those would be a couple instances where you, you might run into issues with, with so-called baggage on a mark. And certainly it's a good example of what Brad was talking about. You need to use it, right? And the U.S. Space Force hasn't been using the Space Force mark yet, but Netflix has been using their Space Force. The series is already out. So um, I encourage you to Google. It's a fun, it's a fun read. Yeah, very interesting. I do have a, a little quick anecdote to add there. Uh, so right before the, the whole COVID uh, lockdown happened, uh, I was down in uh, in LA and visiting one of my friends who's a, a, a former uh, colleague flight test engineer who went on to um, be in Space Command and then rolled over into US Space Force. And uh, he is a, he's done flight testing and whatnot, but his current job is uh, is a contracting officer for Spacelift. And uh, basically he's um, the signatory for all of the United Launch Alliance facelifts. And when I was down there, uh, he was struggling with this dilemma where he had just seen the, the Space Force commander come out and dictate, from now on, all our launches will be branded Space Force, not U.S. Air Force. So they already had a rocket that was like ready to go on the pad, fueled up, you know, ready to light. And he's being told like, hey, um, it sounds like I'm being mandated to go let a contract to go repaint that thing. Uh, what does that do to like the mass properties and all of that? And uh, anyway, we had a beer. Uh, I said, you got some, uh, sounds like you got some challenges to work through. Good luck. And uh, lo and behold, a couple weeks later, it did say U.S. Space Force on the side where it launched. Yeah, it wasn't until fairly recently that the U.S. government agencies started registering trademarks. I think 2013 was the first where the U.S. Marines were attempting to control merchandise that was being created and sold and uh, Etsy and places like this that were not truly affiliated with the armed services whatsoever. I think there were some issues with the use of the mark. And so they they decided to to start registering, and that was that was the first one. And it was it's basically about merchandise for them in a lot of ways, and about controlling the use of the mark for other for other people. But uh, it does it does present an interesting issue if the government selects a mark that has baggage with it, you know. Yeah, indeed. 
Well, um, we're approaching the end of our time here. Um, I'd like to allow some uh, some time for an around the room. Um, if anybody has any uh, any topics, um, you know, things they want to promote, uh, updates on what your organization or company is doing, um, or just you know things in general you'd like to bring up to the group, uh, group uh, the suggested topics for next time. Um, Jay, would you like to? I think you're you're better at leading me around the room here, and maybe have a little more visibility on the Zoom than I have. Um, I, I guess we can you know, open the floor, but um, w would it be I, in, in a normal room setting? I guess for those of you who aren't familiar, we normally just gonna literally go around the room um, and Zoom. I might be calling people out and put them on the spot here. What do you think, Jay? Yeah, I think it was good. I think that uh, the good thing is we kind of did a, some of that, Kyle, at the very start, which was really good where we heard some other things. I mean, like, I think what Jason was talking about was some of the things that he's done with um, iEnergy, Sean Lundgraf, and some of the other funding mechanisms that uh, I want to say STIRs, but uh, uh, those type of things were were good. What, what I would, uh, and what uh, Celinda did was just amazing, I think, what's going on at, at Sparklight. But uh, we also have uh, Richard uh, uh, from uh, TechCU who's joined us since, since then, and he's calling in from, are you, are you from your office right now? Richard, are you in your office down in uh, California? No, I'm not. I just picked up this snazzy uh, shot from before leaving campus, and then of course dropped it right behind me with the Zoom call, or in the Zoom uh, background. And, and I haven't been this since the first week of March. Yeah, I guess I could see it now that I start looking at it a little bit more. That's great. Uh, uh, anything uh, for your per perspective, Richard, on, uh, you know, Richard lives down uh, outside of the Bay, right around the Bay Area, right? Don't you, Richard? Yeah, I'm seven miles from the water. Uh, I'm in the East Bay, uh, work out of the Silicon Valley, of course, being the hub of, uh, or, you know, the emphasis of where everything, I guess you can say, started. Uh, but what I would like to share with everyone is we've gone live. I know that uh, joining the ITC, our goal in doing that is we've been committed to the tech sector, serving the tech community for, gosh, a little over 60 years now, or this year is our 60-year birthday. And uh, in, in my quick share will be that we have launched our second phase out in, in Idaho as of this past week. And so we are able to serve and support in the mortgage space, so the mortgage lending and auto lending while it's not directly tied to technology, as to how we'll be accessed, uh, of course, we'll be digital and, and, and we don't have our brick and mortar there. Uh, we're excited that we are rolling out our phase three this week. Uh, but with that came a notice yesterday that um, infections increased over the past couple of days. And so um, that, that, uh, that's still up in the air. But nonetheless, we're excited to see that I think phase four for Idaho is launching tomorrow or the 13th. And um, those are the updates that we have from Silicon Valley. Fantastic, Rich. Appreciate that. Uh, Kyle, I would say that uh, if it's okay, I would really love us to be able to follow up on what Jason talked about uh, at one of our next couple of meetings and also talk about with you and Matt, if we can really focus on some of these pivots that are companies that are doing. And if anybody on the call has any of those unique pivots, that some companies are making right now, we'd, um, we'd love to be able to highlight those and start, start kind of uh, vetting through those because most of them are, have very entrepreneurial bents about how they're doing things and what's going on. Um, my last comment is also, I remember in 1998 when I was down in U Utah running Verizon Wireless and I had uh, Arun Sarin come, who was also on the chair at the time he was on the board of Cisco and he came and he said he, he came and we did all the beta testing for uh, air touch for uh, new data products that were unrolling out uh, and so we saw the most cutting edge stuff that was taking place with data products and he came and he said I got this new company that's just launched uh, the name of it's Google and he started talking about Google I said well Google and this goes back to what Brad and Jeremy just were talking about who in the world what's Google? I mean, it was like, and now it's probably one of the most renowned names. You probably talk about brands. And Jay, Apple, now they're at that on the risk of losing it because of the Kleenex thing. If it becomes merely descriptive of a class of products, you can lose your trademark or you can lose certain rights in your trademark. And so yeah. you, have, you can have a moment where it becomes merely descriptive over time. That's amazing. That's a good, very good point. Very good illustration on uh, 
or like Xerox was about the same thing, right, Jeremy? So you had Jared, you had that Absolutely. Kleenex. And so um, anyway, I thought that those are amazing things. So um, anyway, I think that uh, unless somebody has something else, I think we had that good time to talk about that, Kyle. And I love doing that at the very front end of this was we describe everything. Jason, do you have anything else you were going to put out there? Yeah, yeah Jay, uh, I forgot to mention that uh, we got some funding from DOE that supplements our technical assistance program that is specifically directed towards the COVID-19 situation. And so if there are any companies working on products that relate to, you know, addressing COVID-19 or, you know, services or anything like that that could benefit from INL technical expertise or uh, our equipment, um, please uh, uh, get in touch with, get in touch with me and uh, I would love to connect them in with some of uh, th those services. Cause I mean, this is free support. Uh, it doesn't cost them anything and it's really easy to set up. So. Hey, Not Jason, a lot of why, don't we, uh, why don't we send that out? We'd love to be able to send that out to all of our folks. If there's any way you give me something, we'll just send that to uh, okay to the rest of the ITC and just broadcast that out because I think that's a great opportunity for us to be able to optimize if we can. And um, if we yeah. can, I would love to be able to uh, this this pivots thing. I think we call Idaho, uh, and I you know I don't know if everybody is on the same way with on the call as I am, but. Um, I'm, I'm very still focused on COVID-19, but I was kind of, uh, don't really like this. All that, I mean, it's just, there's just so much uh, over the last three months. It's almost like we've been inundated with it. So anyway, I'd love to be able to call yeah. this Idaho pivots type thing that we talk about. And then um, have you, anybody here, and then we'll be looking at some of the most amazing companies that have been doing stuff and we'll put them on next year. Cause then we can talk about innovation as it relates to that with tech to market. So. Kyle and Matt are good with that. We'll, we'll maybe focus on that in the next couple of months. Sounds great to me. Okay. Let's see, Matt, are you still with us? Yeah, David keeps muting me, so I keep talking to myself in the car. But um, I was going to say... <laughs> Um, <laughs> David um, must have done it. I only did it one time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I'm screwed. It's <laughs> um, 